Hey there, Math 237 students, Zach here, and welcome to my recap video on week eight. This week was all about optimization. We spent some time learning about how to find the global max and min of a function, z equals f of x, y, throughout some specified region d in the x, y plane. One of the most important results we have on this topic is the extreme value theorem. This is a guarantee that under certain conditions, your function will indeed have a global max and min. You might remember this result from Math 137, but it turns out that it holds in this setting as well. It says that if you have a function that's continuous over the set D, and the set D is both closed and bounded, meaning it contains its boundary points, and it doesn't extend off forever in some direction, then your function F will indeed reach a global max and global min somewhere throughout your region. Now, in addition to the EVT, we also learned that the global max and min can only occur at a few specific locations throughout your region. To see what's going on here, take a look at this picture on the right. You can see that we're optimizing some continuous function, z equals f of x, y, over some closed and bounded region, d. The global max of our function is going to occur at this point right here, which is a critical point inside our region. The global minimum occurs at this point here, which lies on the boundary of D. In general, these are the only two options for the location of a global max or min, at critical points inside the region or at points along the boundary. Well, last week we spent lots of time talking about how to locate critical points, so I'm not going to focus on that in this video. Instead, I'm going to talk about optimizing over the boundary. If your boundary is particularly simple, like a straight line for example, then you can restrict your function to the boundary pretty easily and reduce it to just a single variable function. Then you can use techniques from Math 137 to find its global max and min. But what do we do if we have a more complicated boundary curve, like this ellipse that you see here? Turns out we have a really nice algorithm called the method of Lagrange multipliers that will allow us to maximize or minimize our function over such a boundary curve. In this video, I'm going to give you a little bit of intuition as to why that algorithm works. Okay, so once again, I'm restricting my attention to just the boundary of our region. The points along this boundary are going to satisfy a certain equation, which maybe we could write as g of x, y equals to a constant k. For example, if this equation were x squared plus y squared equals 1, we would be considering points along the unit circle. The question is, how big or small can the values of my function get if I restrict my attention to just this boundary curve? Well, if you think about it, if we're trying to say something about the size of the values of the function, we're really saying something about its level curves, right? The level curves tell us all points where our function attains a particular value. So for example, this would be the level curve where my function attains a height of six. Do I have any points along the boundary where my function attains a height of six? No, you can see there's no intersection between this level curve and our elliptical boundary. So what do we do? We lower our standards. We can't get a height of 6, but maybe we could get a height of 5. Hmm, no dice. There are still no points on this boundary where we get a height of 5. So we continue to lower our standards until we get to this level curve right here, where something magical happens. Here you can see that we have a point that lies just on our constraint curve, g of x, y equals k, where our function reaches a height of 3. And actually, this is the best we can do. If we ask for any larger value of our function, then we're talking about a level curve that's a little farther away. There are no points on that level curve that lie on the constraint curve. So this point here is actually our global max subject to the constraint. We can do the same sort of thing to find our global min. We can continue to lower our level curves until we get to this level curve right here, where our function has a value of minus one. There you can see we have again a point that just lies on our constraint curve. So it satisfies the constraint and our function value is as small as possible. Any lower and we move off of that constraint curve. So this is our global min. Now folks, if you understood this discussion, then I think you understand the main idea behind the method of Lagrange multipliers. The big observation here is that the global max and min of our function subject to this constraint must occur at points where the level curves are just tangent to the constraint curve. Now this is a pretty observation, but how do we actually use this in practice to help locate the global max and min? How do we find the points where the level curves are just tangent to the constraint curve? 
It turns out the answer to this question comes from our knowledge of gradient vectors. Remember, the gradient vectors of the function f of x, y are always going to point us in the direction of steepest ascent. You can see from these level curves that my function is increasing as we move this way. We also know that the gradient vectors are orthogonal to the level curves. So I'm just going to go ahead and plot a whole bunch of gradient vectors here for my function f of x, y. The gradients are perpendicular to the level curves, and they're always going to sort of point in the upper right direction, in the direction of steepest ascent. Okay, so these are the gradients for f of x, y, but what about g of x, y? z equals g of x, y is a perfectly good function, and so we should be able to talk about its gradients as well. The gradients are still going to point orthogonally to the level curves of g of x, y. Ah, but hold on a second g of x, y equals k is a level curve. So whatever the gradients are doing here, they're going to be pointing orthogonally to this elliptical boundary. They might be pointing in, they might be pointing out, we're not sure, but the gradients are going to look something like this. Now do you notice anything interesting happening at our global max or global min? It looks to me like the gradients of f and g at these points are pointing parallel to each other, right? They're either pointing in the exact same direction or the complete opposite direction. This, folks, is the key. At the points where the level curves are just tangent to the constraint curve, the gradient of f is going to be a scalar multiple, a multiple lambda, of the gradient of g. This is sometimes called the Lagrange equation, and this is the equation that we're going to solve when looking for these points. Now, there are a couple exceptional cases to keep in mind here. Firstly, it could be that the gradient of g is equal to zero at certain points along this constraint curve. If that's the case, we could run into some weird situations where the global max occurs at a point where the gradient of g is zero, and hence the whole right-hand side here is zero, but the gradient of f is not zero. And if that's the case, then you're never going to be able to satisfy this equation. So we're going to have to check the points where the gradient of g is zero separately, but that's not usually a big deal. Secondly, it could also be the case that your curve is not a loop like this. Maybe your constraint curve is just some curved line in space. If that's the case, it might have some endpoints, and the endpoints would have to be checked separately. And that's the big idea, folks. I'm going to wrap up this video on the next slide by giving you the precise statement of the method of Lagrange multipliers, and you can compare with what we've just discussed. Okay, here's your summary. If we're trying to optimize a differentiable function f subject to some constraint g of x, y equals k, where here g is c1, then we're going to look for all points a, b, where either the gradient of f is a multiple of the gradient of g, and of course the points lie on the constraint curve, or the gradient of g is 0 and the point lies on the constraint curve, or the point a, b is an endpoint of our constraint curve. We compare the values of our function at all of the points we find in steps 1 to 3. The largest is our global max, and the smallest is our global min.